This is Walter Bosley. I'm going to read chapter 13 from Nick Redfern's Final Events. The Black Sorcerer. During the late 1960s, the CIA experimented with mediums in an attempt to contact and possibly debrief dead CIA agents. These attempts, according to Victor Marchetti, a former high-ranking CIA official, were part of a larger effort to harness psychic powers for various intelligence-related missions that included utilizing clairvoyance to divine the intentions of the Kremlin leadership. This written by Dr. Nelson Pacheco and Tommy Bland in their book, Unmasking the Enemy. It was also, as a result of this series of CIA experiments with mediums, Robert Manners told Redfern, that a shocking and terrifying discovery was made, a discovery that supported the beliefs and theories of the Collins elite, and which also saw their operational abilities and scope increased. Manners pointed out that it is critical to be aware of the time frame of this new development. Within the shadowy world of espionage, very strange things of a truly occult-like and demonic nature were pressing ahead during the late 1960s and early 1970s. And to understand and appreciate the precise nature of the matter, Manners said, it's necessary to delve into the world of Dr. Sidney Gottlieb. A product of New York's Bronx, Gottlieb obtained a Ph.D. in chemistry from the California Institute of Technology and a master's degree in speech therapy. Then, in 1951, he was offered the position as head of the chemical division of the CIA's technical services staff, a job that focused to a great extent on two issues, the development of lethal poisons for use in clandestine assassination operations, and understanding, harnessing, and manipulating the human brain. Mind control, in other words. It was Gottlieb's work in these fields that led him to become known within the U.S. intelligence community as the Black Sorcerer. It proved to be a very apt title indeed. In April 1953, Gottlieb began coordinating the work of the CIA's MKUltra project, which was activated on the orders of the CIA director Alan Dulles. Gottlieb routinely administered LSD, as well as a variety of other psychoactive drugs, to unwitting subjects as he sought to develop techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit anything. End quote. In March 1960, under the Cuban Project, a CIA plan approved by President Eisenhower and overseen by the CIA's Directorate for Plans, Richard M. Bissell, Gottlieb suggested spraying Fidel Castro's television studio with LSD and saturating Castro's shoes with thallium so that his beard would fall out. Gottlieb also hatched schemes to assassinate Castro that would have made the character Q from the James Bond novels and movies proud including the use of a poisoned cigar, a poisoned wetsuit, an exploding conch shell, and a poisonous fountain pen. History has shown that all of the attempts failed, and Castro had just about as many lives as a cat, if not more. But Gottlieb was not finished with assassination attempts. He also worked on a project to have Iraq's General Abdul Karim Qasim's handkerchief contaminated with botulinum, and he played a role in the CIA's attempt to assassinate Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. In the summer of 1960, Gottlieb himself secretly transported certain toxic biological materials, as he called them, to the CIA's field station in the Congo. As fate would have it, however, a military coup deposed the Prime Minister before agents were able to unleash the deadly virus. Almost a decade later, Gottlieb began delving into far darker areas. In 1969, Robert Manners revealed to Redfern a unit of scientists attached to the CIA's Office of Research and Development had dared to follow the path the technical services 
section had taken a decade and a half earlier in the field of mind control. But the scientists had other, far more controversial plans, several of which involved trying to invade, understand, and harness demonic powers as tools of espionage. To ensure that the project stood some chance of achieving its unusual claims, Gottlieb approached Richard Helms, the CIA director from 1966 to 1973, and secured a $150,000 grant for the new project, which became known as Operation Often. The curiously named study took its title from the fact that Gottlieb was well known for reminding his colleagues that, and I quote, often we are very close to our goals, then we pull back. And, quoting again, often we forget that the only scientific way forward is to learn from the past. End quote. Investigative writer Gordon Thomas said, Operation Often's roots could be traced back to the research Dr. Donald Ewan Cameron had approved in trying to establish links between eye coloring, soil conditions, and mental illness. Thomas also noted that when he was given access to Cameron's research and notes after Cameron's death in 1967, Gottlieb was struck by the fact that Dr. Cameron could have been on the verge of a breakthrough in exploring the paranormal. Operation Often was intended to take over the unfinished work and go beyond, to explore the world of black magic and the supernatural. And thus the stage was set for the next act in the U.S. government's involvement in and understanding of what they perceived to be the true nature of the UFO presence on Earth. But who exactly was Dr. Cameron, a Scottish-American psychiatrist from Scotland's Bridge of Allen, who graduated from the University of Glasgow in 1924. He later moved to Albany, New York, and, like the black sorcerer himself, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, became involved in the controversial MK Ultra. After being recruited by the CIA, Cameron commuted to Montreal, Canada every week, where he worked at the Allen Memorial Institute of the McGill University and was paid $69,000 from 1957 to 1964 to secretly undertake experimentation on specific half of MK Ultra. It is not surprising, therefore, that Gottlieb picked up some of the strands of Cameron's work after his death in 67. As Operation Often progressed, the project began to immerse itself in distinctly uncharted waters and the staff ultimately spent more time mingling with fairground fortune tellers, palmists, clairvoyants, demonologists, and mediums than they did with fellow agency personnel. By May 1971, the operation even had three astrologers on the payroll, each of whom were paid the tidy sum of $350 per week, plus expenses. To regularly review copies of newly published magazines and newspapers in the hope that they might be psychically alerted to something of a defense or intelligence nature. And things got even more controversial. In April 1972, in an effort to understand more about demonology and to ascertain if the subject held any meaningful intelligence applications, two Operation Often operatives clandestinely approached the Monsignor in charge of exorcisms for New York's Catholic Diocese. He quickly sent them packing, utterly refusing to get involved in the project in any manner. The relationship between Operation Often and the Collins elite was very different, however. Two years before, on January 31st, 1970, a man attached to the Collins elite, who Robert Manners described only as Mr. Manza, visited the offices of Operation Often. It appears from what Manners said, however, that the Collins elite had heard of Operation Often's very early work in the field of espionage and the occult and wished to determine if some sort of liaison might prove profitable and significant for both parties. The date of the meeting certainly seems to have been significant, as this occurred just six weeks after the U.S. Air Force closed its publicly acknowledged UFO investigative operation, Project Blue Book, on December 17, 1969. However, UFO investigator Brad Sparks has said 
that the last day of Blue Book activity was actually January 30th, 1970, just one day before Mr. Monza's little visit. That the Collins elite apparently took steps to take their quest for the truth about UFOs to a new level just 24 hours after Project Blue Book finally shut down may not be entirely coincidental. Perhaps, although this is admittedly speculation on Redfern's part, those within the corridors of power viewed the closing of Blue Book as just the right time to increase the workload of UFO research bodies like the Collins elite that were still overwhelmingly free of public congressional and media attention and scrutiny. If Blue Book had laid to rest, or more correctly, had tried to lay to rest any notion that the Air Force was hiding fantastic secrets about extraterrestrial visitations and alien encounters, then maybe it was time for the Collins elite to become the new sheriff in town, one whose agenda was very different than Blue Book's. As an aside, also in 1969, the U.S. Government Printing Office issued a publication compiled by the Library of Congress for the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, which was titled UFOs and Related Subjects, an Annotated Biography. In preparing the work, the senior bibliographer Lynn E. Cato dug deeply into thousands of UFO articles and books. In the 400-page document, she stated, and I quote, a large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeist manifestations and possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomena." End quote. No doubt, members of the Collins elite nodded gravely at that revelation. This is Walter Bosley, and I just read chapter 13 from Final Events by Nick Redfern. <laughs>